Well, it's great to see you again tonight. Let's see, I've lost count. Is this uh, week four? Week number four. Well, congratulations on making it through three of the weeks so far. Uh, all right, this, this is where it gets tricky. Up to this point, Alpha's been pretty simple. But at this point, it gets a little tricky, right? So normally you'd go one, two, three, four. But we're not going to go one, two, three, four. Actually, we're going to be in chapter six tonight. And I'm not supposed to be speaking. Frank is supposed to be speaking. So it's just all upside down tonight. So if you can just deal with that, you'll just do fine. But go ahead and turn in your little red book to session number six. And that's going to be on page 33. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the Bible and and reading the Bible and understanding the Bible. Um, and this is, you know, all these topics just in some way are, are topics that are endearing to me because they're, they're aspects that have had an impact on my life. And, and I think perhaps this one's right up there with any of the topics that we would talk about is the impact of the Bible on, uh, on my life personally. I, I can remember being in high school, uh, this is 1978, uh, I wander into a high school gymnasium and during the lunch period there is a Bible study going on in this gymnasium and a guy named Frank Loria, yep, the same guy that you've been listening to every week here, uh, is, is doing a little Bible study with a bunch of high school students and he's just asking a few questions and talking about the Bible. And, you know, as simple as that sounds, I had never really been around that happening. I'd, I'd been to church a lot, and I'd heard people read from the Bible, but I'd never really heard people just talk about the Bible. And not just the average guy. He didn't have any special clothing on. He wasn't some special clergy member. He's just an average guy talking about the Bible. And so that made me really curious of what is this Bible all about? And so I went home, and eventually I, I wanted to read the Bible for myself. And so I... I dug around my house and found in my brother's room this little Bible that he had tucked away there. And it is, this is the 1978 version of the first Bible I ever read. And I picked it up and, and you know, I'm grateful that, that I was in high school because at my age now I can't read it anymore. Uh, <laughs> print's way too small. But I just started reading this, this mysterious book that had always kind of been somewhere around my life and was just drawn in to reading it and it began to, to just speak to me, I guess is the best words I could choose to describe. It just, it, it related to my life. It, it found its way into real spaces for me and, and real questions, even it's just a high school person that I was asking and, and even some impressions that I had that I'd learned through religion that just didn't seem to go along with some of the things that I was reading in the Bible. So I, I read more and more and more of it and it had, I'd say to this day, nothing has had a greater impact in my life than this little book, um, this Bible. And this is just a New Testament. It's not the whole Bible, but it was enough for me to get acquainted with that book. And so tonight, what I'd like to do, I, I feel like this would be a greatly successful night, is if you just leave here tonight saying, okay, I, I, I want to pick a Bible up and have a read and just start looking at that. And, and so I realize that, that maybe we're in different places when it comes to how we feel about the Bible. Uh, there, you may be here tonight feeling like, you know, I don't know what to think about the Bible and maybe what I have been exposed to has made me skeptical of it. I don't know if I can trust it. Um, it's just got sayings from outdated places and, and, and people have written it down. They've changed it over the years and maybe all kinds of thoughts come from you when it comes to the Bible. And I hope maybe tonight some of that can, can get some answers to it or maybe some fresh information dumped into that location. Or, or maybe you've known about the Bible and you're not antagonistic to it. There's no hostility toward the Bible. But you've never really read it. I mean, you've heard bits and pieces. You've heard it quoted a little bit. But you've never actually picked the Bible up and, and read that book for yourself. Um, well, I, I hope tonight what we hear will, will help this book to make more sense to you tonight. We're not going to cover anything really drastically deep, but just some, some basics about what the Bible is that I think will be really helpful. So here's what we heard, are going to hear in your outline here. On page 34, a little book says, Why and how should I read the Bible? And the first thing it starts off telling us is that this, this book is not like any other book. It's unique. And he says it's uniquely popular. 
It's uniquely precious and it's uniquely powerful. And so one of the things that you know, we're going to do here tonight, we're going to talk about a book that's got thousands of years of age behind it. This is the latest thing. This isn't a trendy idea. This isn't just that just came out last week and it's cutting edge and let's talk about it. But isn't it amazing that a book this old is still the subject of people's study and pursuit? And I, and I think it is because this is an amazingly unique book. So let me just take a few moments just to talk about some of the uniqueness of this book. If you were to look at other popular books, right, if you looked at top five selling authors in the 1990s, right, you get guys like this, John Gresham, Stephen King, Danielle Steele, right, so I'm not sure if you're a big reader, you probably have found something that these guys have written in the 1990s and spent some time, maybe you're just waiting for the movie to come out, okay. Um, <laughs> But if you added all those numbers, those are significant numbers. These guys are making a good living. That's, that's a lot of books to sell. But if you compare the number of Bibles that were sold in the 1990s, they wouldn't even come close. Right? The Bible's distribution and sales are outrageously incomparable to anything else that's in the world. And the Bible has affected people. It's affected ideas. You and I live in ideas that the Bible really was the basis for many of those ideas. And so all kinds of folks through the ages have referenced the Bible and its impact upon their lives. Right, if we looked at George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Abraham Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. Ronald Reagan said, within the covers of the Bible are all the answers for all the problems men face. That, that's an enormous statement, right? And these are men who have influenced and been influenced by all kinds of ideas. It was a world-renowned archaeologist named Nelson Gluck. Uh, he did research and archaeological research all over the world, made all kinds of amazing discoveries, and here he is on the cover of Time magazine. He says, I have excavated for 30 years with a Bible in one hand and a trowel in the other, and in matters of historical perspective, I have never found the Bible to be in error. Here's Time magazine after the Bible had gone through all kinds of trials through the years of people examining it, cross-examining it, questioning it, could it be trusted, is it reliable? They raised this question and concluded, after more than two centuries of facing the heaviest scientific guns that could be brought to bear, the Bible has survived and is perhaps the better for the state. For the for the siege. Of course, if I had eyes, I could see that far away. Even on the critics' own terms, historical fact, the scriptures seem more acceptable now than they did when the rationalists began the attack. So you guys, if you follow philosophy and sort of the ages in which we live, the, the age of enlightenment uh, occurred and the philosophies of man began to change and religious ideas that had been previously accepted suddenly got challenged. And so the culture was pushing back on things religious and pushing back specifically on the Bible as to whether or not it could be trusted. Was it reliable? And after, like he says, a couple of centuries of these tests, the Bible still withstood those criticisms and people's opposition. Chuck Colson, who uh, you might guys might remember him from the Nixon years. He was part of uh, uh, President Nixon's uh, cabinet. He says, the Bible banned, burned, beloved. More widely read, more frequently attacked than any other book in history. Generations of intellectuals have attempted to discredit it. Dictators of every age have outlawed it and executed those who read it. Yet soldiers carry it into battle, believing it more powerful than their weapons. Fragments of it smuggled into solitary prison cells have transformed ruthless killers into gentle saints. So this book has had an amazing impact in history, right? In our culture, uh, we make room for the Bible still, even today, in unique ways that we don't with any other book, right? If you were just to travel around and take a survey, this is a hard one to read. I don't know if we can see it real well. Most stock library books 
in all the libraries that you, that you can go find books and get a record of what they have. The Bible is number one. Almost 800,000 libraries contain copies of the Bible. And you jump down from that to the U.S. Census, which is a little more than half of that number of libraries. And then before you get to books, Mother Goose is the next uh, most popular book than the Divine Comedy, the Odyssey, the Iliad, and all these guys are less than 10% of the number of libraries that stock these other books. And so it, it's certainly accurate to say the Bible sits uniquely in human history. There simply really is no other book like it. So even if you're unfamiliar with it, you're not unfamiliar with how it has touched the society that you and I live in. How it's framed our value system. Right? There are dimensions to the Ten Commandments that inform our morality. That laws that are framed in, in nearly every culture around the world have some element of reflecting the ideas presented in the Ten Commandments which are found in the Bible. You know, the golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Those are shaping our morals today. And then you look at how the Bible has taught people about compassion and care. How to love people and be involved in the needs that are around this world. And all around our culture, you are bumping into the Bible's influence to create those places where that care is being manifest. The um, uh, other night, my family and I went to go see the movie Sully. You guys have seen this movie about the guy lands the plane in New York? Uh, well, you know, when they, they evacuate all the people off the, the plane in this water evacuation and they bring them onto the shore finally, they wrap blankets around them and on the blankets is the red cross. You ever thought about where that comes from? The red cross? It's a reference to the cross of Christ. It's a reference to the compassion and care that God gave to broken humanity when he sent his son into this world. Right? In just a couple of months you're going to be walking into a department store and there's going to be a little person out there ringing a bell. And they're going to be with who? The Salvation Army. Have you ever thought about why they're called the Salvation Army? Well, I'm not quite sure I, I get the army part, although I know the history of the, of the group. But they get their idea of, of salvation from the Bible. The Bible presents that man is in a condition that he needs salvation. And so they are a charitable organization that goes in that name into people's lives. And, and this is true all over the place. You know, St. Jude's Hospital. St. Jude's Hospital. Right? From the Apostle Jude and represented biblical teachings into the needs of people's lives that we should bring healing into people's lives that are broken. And you may have seen in the news recently, Mother Teresa was in the news for her compassionate care and uh, care for orphans and down and out and desperate people in India that she's lived her life doing that. Well, where'd she get the idea to do that? Well, from the Bible. So these, the Bible has shaped our lives. Even if we've never noticed exactly where these ideas come from, they come from the Bible. All right, well, question for us. Is the Bible just one man's opinion? I mean, let's face it. When we start reading the Bible and we start talking about the Bible, it starts getting into issues of life. How do you do this? Right and wrong gets addressed and defined. Well, isn't the Bible just like one person's opinion? Well, well let, me, let me answer that in two ways. Let me, let me address the idea that how do we deal with something that has a lot of opinions in it? Because in this discussion about religion, there's all kinds of religions out there, isn't there? There's all kinds of views about how people ought to believe and how to live their life. And, and, and this is what I've noticed in the last maybe 40 years or so. As we approach something that's got a lot of opinions to it, it's almost as though all those opinions mean any of them could be true. Is that true though? Just because something's got a lot of opinions mixed into it, does that mean there isn't one opinion that might actually be the right one? Right, we don't feel that way in a lot of other categories of our lives. 
Right? There are all kinds of scientific opinions. There's genetic scientific opinions about why you and I are the way we are. Why diseases behave the way that they do. And there's all kinds of opinions. There's opinions about the origin of life. There's opinions about disease treatment. There's opinion, uh, opinions about digestion and weight. How many of you guys know that there's a few opinions about what's the right diet out there? <laughs> All right, right, there's lots of opinions, but just because you can multiply opinions, does that end up meaning that there isn't one that's right? right we don't think that way. We don't think that way about history. Right? We read historical books that have opinions about groups of people. That this group migrated from here to here first, and then they had this civilization, and then they did this and traveled over here and formed these ideas. And somebody else comes along and says, no, no, not exactly. This group came first, and they were here first. And then this group came second. And then we read another opinion somewhere else. All right, so there's lots of opinions about history, too. Does that mean because there's lots of opinions, there's not a right one? Well, of course not. Something actually happened back in history. Now, whether we've discovered it or not, that might be a question, but something did actually happen. So, can there be many opinions and just one of them be right? Well, of course there can. That, that happens to us all the time. But what's unique about the Bible is we consider it, you know, does the Bible just one man's opinion? Well, actually, the Bible is not just one man's opinion. Again, another factor of its uniqueness is, is how it comes into existence, how it's actually written. Ain't no way I'm going to read that. Uh, the Bible's actually 66 books written down by 40 different authors over a period of closer to about 1,500 years in three different languages on three different continents. And so, so the Bible is actually a collection of books. I know we call the Bible a book, but it's actually a collection of smaller books that are all put together into one book. And so it is 66 books. And some of them are very, very small, and some of them have some decent size to them. Uh, there's different authors that were included in writing the Bible. There were shepherds, kings, scholars, prophets, fishermen, farmers. All the different varieties of writers that we get the Bible from had a variety of backgrounds and experiences. They wrote in different places. They, some of them were kings and palaces. Some of them were in prison when they wrote aspects of the Bible. Some of them were in the wilderness in their lives writing. There is a variety of styles that are in the Bible. And this is a very important element to just basic reading of the Bible. That not every book in the Bible is intended to be read the same way. Right? Because you have different styles of writing in the Bible intentionally. You have historical books in the Bible. You have biographical books in the Bible. You have poetry and songs that are in the Bible. You have prophecy, proverbs. You have letters in the Bible where dear so-and-so writing a letter to you and the Bible intends for you to read that like a letter. So when we collect all these books together, it'd be better to say that the Bible's more like a library of books than it is just one book. And so this, this would be how the, the Bible, if you was sitting on a bookshelf, you'd have sections of the Bible in it, right? So you'd start off Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, the very beginning of the Bible. That, that would fit under the law aspect of the Bible, which is very much like history. That next long section of the Old Testament is written historically. It's just telling you about a group of people, what they did, what God did with them, things that he communicated, different times and settings that he was teaching them things, and there's a recorded history of that. And you fast forward a little bit into the Old Testament and you get to books like Job and Psalms. A lot of us have read from the Psalms. Proverbs. These are, these are poetic books. The, the book of Psalms is actually a song book. They're songs. And so you read them like songs. And there'd be imagery in them. They'd be very different than a history book because it's just not trying to tell you this fact followed this fact followed this location and this guy. They're poetic. They're trying to get you to see things and imagine concepts and have your heart moved a certain way. All right. So then we fast forward all the way into the New Testament down here. You have Gospels. that are These are all biographical books that are written about the person of Jesus Christ, specifically while he was upon the earth. So those, if you open up your Bible to that section, 
you're going to be reading somebody's biographical sketch of uh, Jesus did this, and then he went there, and he met this person, and he performed that miracle, and he said these things. Right? So you, you read that in the Gospels, and then you fast forward a little bit more, you get into Paul's letters. A great deal of the New Testament is letters written by the Apostle Paul, where he's addressing particular individuals and people groups. Most of them would be churches that were in different locations throughout the Mediterranean, where he would write things to them. And, and this is how God used people to bring the Bible into existence. So listen, that, that's very helpful because I know sometimes people, they approach the Bible with this idea that, well, you know, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. Well, not if you play by the rules, you can't. If you decide that, well, I just treat everything like it's poetry. So if I read a, a book of history and it says something that's, that's kind of way out there, well, I just treat that like it's poetry. It's just poetic language. Well, no, you treat history like it's history. And you treat poetry like it's poetry. But that helps a lot when we go to read the Bible and try and understand what it's really trying to say. But, but here's what's an amazing thing. Forty different people over a span of 1,500 years, right? So, I mean, just imagine. There's cultural things that shape what's popular today, right? You and I are, somehow, if we're writing about today, we're, we're, we're writing about the pol politics of our country because it's everywhere in the news. We're writing about cell phones in our pockets because they're just prevalent. But, I mean, you guys, you go back 20 years and nobody's got a cell phone. Just 20 years ago. People aren't running around with cell phones. So there's a massive shifting in culture. What could happen over 1,500 years? People begin to write about ideas as controversial as religion. And the God who exists, what is he like? Where did we all come from? What's the right way to behave? What's the right thing to believe? What's right and wrong about how we do life? Over a 1,500 year span, in different cultures... Would they all write the same stuff? Or would this book just sound like a hodgepodge of crazy ideas? I mean, you just imagine. I mean, here we are, here we are in New Orleans. You know, New Orleans is a kind of a closed community. If you're from here, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. You got relatives here, generations here. And so we all kind of grew up somewhere. Somebody in your family knows somebody else's family here in this room. So if I took 40 people from New Orleans and stuck them in a library together, just said, hey, here's a piece of paper. I want you to write down some thoughts about things like religion and God. What is he like? What is belief like? What is faith all about? And you just let them write. What's right and wrong? What kind of behaviors are okay and which ones are not? Do you think you'd end up with the same ideas on everybody's piece of paper? Or would you have quite a variety of opinions and views? Even though we all grew up in the same time and place and speak the same language. I mean, if you took that same... 40 people stuck them in a room and said, hey, write about the meaning of Hurricane Katrina. Why did that happen and what was, it, what was significant about it? Do you think everybody would write the same thing? If you said, hey, worst, absolute worst draft pick by the Saints ever. <laughs> How many of y'all would say Russell Erksleben? Let me just see. All right, see, there'd be a little bit of agreement, but after that, who knows where we'd go, right? But yet the Bible is written over that span of time using different people to convey the same message. This is a unique, unique book in what it accomplishes like no other book that's ever existed. All right, in your outline there, that little first section on page 34, it says, it is bringing revelation. The Bible is bringing revelation and insight. God has spoken. So, Let's look for a moment at just what the Bible says about itself. What, what is this book that we are trying to get to figure out a little bit about? Let's look at this passage and what happened here. That's the wrong passage. Let me try this again. Nope. Nope. Hey, uh, Eric? <laughs> Let's see, who can, I, who can volunteer for me to go and go and find Eric and tell Eric he pulled up the wrong slideshow? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's probably nothing you can do staring at that thing. You're going to need a specialist to, to take care of this. <laughs> he just pulled up the wrong thing. All right, well, let me see if I can just 
walk you guys through some thoughts here. Here's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate and equipped in every good work. All right, so all scripture is inspired by God. So, so where do we get scripture? Give me just one second. Eric, whatever I sent you today, that's not it. So the one that I sent you, if you can find that somehow and open that up, that will help me <laughs> tremendously. Um, all right, so all scripture is inspired by God. So when we come to the Bible, we've got these writings and we just learn where they came from, but the Bible claims this, that all of Scripture is inspired by God. Ultimately, the source of all these ideas and all these insights that get written down, it is God himself. Now, that would make huge sense for us to try and understand why does this book that gets written by different people stay together? Why do people from different cultures and different times keep writing the same way about these same ideas? Well, because God says that he was the one who inspired the thoughts and the ideas that went into the writers who wrote down the Bible. I, mean, I do think this, well, we'll let Eric find that. The, uh, here's another passage in the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 says this. This is the Apostle Peter, right? Remember that you guys remember who the Apostle Peter was? He was the guy who walked with Jesus. He spent time with him while Jesus was actually here upon the earth. Now Jesus has been dead and resurrected now for some 30 plus years. And along comes the Apostle Peter. He writes these thoughts down. He says, for we, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Right? What Peter claims that he was, he claims that he was an eyewitness. He saw these things that are written about this Jesus Christ, right? These aren't myths, you know, this isn't like Greek mythology. And no one knows where this stuff really actually came from. It just got its own life over the years. Peter says, no, 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 that's, that's not what we were writing to you. That's not what we've been telling you. We actually saw these things. And he, and he shows one of the examples. He says, for when he, speaking of Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father... And the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. So when we pick up the gospels you read a story about one day that Jesus took with him three of his disciples and he, he went up a mountain and, and Jesus had a meeting with God the Father and a voice came from heaven and those that were with him heard the voice speak saying exactly that. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So these men were eyewitnesses to things. When they wrote about events and miracles that Jesus did they weren't writing about folklore that had mysteriously gotten passed down from who knows where. Whether it ever happened or not. Just urban legend kind of stuff. No, they had actually watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. They were with him in the boat when the seas were out of control and Jesus just spoke. And in an instant, the wind stopped and all the waves calmed down. These are eyewitnesses. Now you think for a minute... These were people who not only did they write these things down for other people, what they wrote down and what they shared with others was going to cost them their very lives. Most of the 12 apostles who were with Jesus were martyred and lost their lives because of what they believed. Because they believed something that made them social outcasts. It made them a threat to Rome. It made them weird. And it made them easy to blame. They were this outcast group that, that was easy to say, well, those Christians over there did that. And so they began to be threatened, be ostracized. They would lose their jobs. How long would you just stay unemployed and ostracized from your family and from your culture and from getting a decent job 
in order to promote something that you knew was false. You had written down some ideas. You're not popular over it. You're not writing books. You're not showing up on Oprah or some late night talk show. This, this isn't a fun gig. Why would you do that if you knew what you were writing down you had made up and it wasn't true? It doesn't make any sense. What they did was they bore witness to something that they had actually seen and all they could do was tell the truth about it. And the scriptures record that the events of Jesus Christ's life really did happen. Uh, listen, see, this is an interesting thing. If you were going to start a franchise, you would call it the religious franchise, right? And you're going to try and sell this thing. And you need to try to get people to buy in on it. This would have been the worst religious franchise idea ever. Ever. Right? So here's what you're going to do. I'm going to create a religion for you. Here's the two popular groups that are out there that you're going to ask them to go through your drive-up window. You've got Jews on the one hand, and you've got Gentiles on the other. All right? And your religion is going to offend one group, and the other group's going to laugh at you. All right, so here's Christianity. It promotes a Messiah who comes to these Jewish people, and he comes as a peasant, and at the end of his life, he's going to be killed by the tyrannical, horrible Romans. Doesn't sound like a success story. Sounds like a huge failure. So the Jews are waiting for a king to come riding in on a horse. Instead, they get this lowly peasant comes riding in on a donkey. Right? Not the story that you would write if you were writing a story about this religion that you wanted everybody to believe. So the Jews rejected Jesus. The Gentiles thought this was the most religious, the most ridiculous religion to believe in. They had all these Greek and Roman gods that were more like superheroes, you know, they kind of wore capes and flew and did all kinds of cool stuff. And you got this guy who comes along, he carpenter from Nazareth, and a Jew as well, among the Jewish people who are oppressed by the Romans, they can't even get out from underneath the Roman thumb, and you want me to believe in one of them, and put all my hope in him. And yet here you and I are, a couple of thousand years later, still talking about this peasant king from Judea. A little strange, don't you think? This book, this Bible that talks about this individual and promotes who he is. And you and I are here gathered tonight and we're going to talk about that book yet again. There is something unique about what this book is about and what we believe as Christians. Right? I mean, I'm not sure if we're on track or not here. Let's find out. Yeah, that works. I think it does. Second Peter... Apostle Peter goes on here and he says, and we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. That's an interesting phrase, right? A little poetic here, right? A star rising in your heart. You're not taking that literally, are you? Right, well, you got to read the Bible, you got to read the Bible. There's a saying here though, it, there's light coming into the human soul. Right? And that's one of the amazing things that the Bible does is God has put together a revelation that's like a light that shines inside of us and it makes sense of life and it reveals things to us on the inside. That's exactly what this book does. He goes on and says, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All right, so here the Bible declares, what is this book? Well, it is God moving on people and giving them something to write about. It's not a matter of one's own interpretation. It's not as though these guys wrote down their opinions and here you and I are, all these thousands of years later, reading about some knucklehead fisherman who had some crazy dream or something, he wrote it down, and we're still talking about it. Well, no, the Bible actually says that that's, not, that's exactly what didn't happen. What did happen was people were moved by God and the God of the universe who is over everything chose to communicate in words that he gave to these individuals and they wrote those things down. And you and I are reading that today. And there's things in scripture that no man could have known. There's this prophetic nature of the Bible that the Bible stands at a certain time slot, gives insights to a man about something that's going to happen way, way over there. There's, there's no way. There, you know, they hadn't invented time travel yet. 
How did these people know what was going to happen in the future? Well, they knew because the God who knows everything was letting them in on things that were going to be happening in the future, right? So we, we see some of these as it, as it pertains to Jesus Christ. The things that Jesus Christ fulfilled. Many prophecies in the Bible. Let me just give you several of these. His place of birth. Right? The prophet Micah wrote this down. But you, O Bethlehem, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now Micah wrote that down in 750 B.C. Now you and I today are still singing, O little town of Bethlehem. And the reason why was because in Bethlehem would be born the Savior who would be king over all of humanity, but here king over Israel. How could Micah have known that? Where the Messiah would be born? Well, he couldn't have. But God could have told him because God knows everything. The type of his birth, you'll find in Isaiah chapter 7, written in 740 BC. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Right? 740 years before his birth. His time of appearance is written specifically about in the book of Daniel. In 600 BC he records it. Jerusalem entrance, right? Your king, Zechariah said, is coming to you mounted on a donkey. And they quoted this verse when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem just before, a few days before he would be crucified. The king was coming not, on, not with an army and not mounted on a horse lowly and humble and riding on a donkey. But he writes that down in 520 B.C. His betrayal. How specific is this? The prophet Zechariah, again, 520 B.C. says, for 30 pieces of silver would be thrown into the house of the Lord to the potter. Jesus Christ was betrayed by, by Judas. You guys remember the story. He gets bought out. He turns on Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And when Judas comes to his senses, if that's what he was doing, and he realizes what he's done, that he's betrayed Christ into the hands of people who are going to kill him, he goes back to the temple with his blood money, and he gives it back to them. And because it's blood money, they won't receive it. They take it and they actually go buy a potter's field with the 30 pieces of silver that were returned. But that's exactly what Zechariah said would happen. And he said that in 520 B.C., his type of death. In Psalm 22, there's a description of the Savior being murdered with his arms and his feet being pierced, being crucified. What's interesting here, this is probably about 800 years before crucifixion was even invented by the Romans. The psalmist is writing and seeing the day. Well, he, he couldn't know that unless God told him about it in advance. His burial, Isaiah written again 700 or so BC. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And that's an interesting description. But if you follow Jesus' story, he was crucified along with two thieves. And then he was buried in a borrowed tomb that belonged to a wealthy man. In exact fulfillment of what the prophecy said. And then his resurrection is prophesied about in Psalm 16. Now, what's interesting is what, what God has done is, is he has left this trail of crumbs, if you will, all along the way, starting hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus Christ ever came. He was pointing in advance. It's almost as if you're driving down the, the timeline of life and you keep seeing these billboards. 740 years from now, 520 years from now, 400 and something years from now, you keep seeing these statements being made so that when they happen... We'd be able to figure out who is this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, who rode in on a donkey, who fulfilled all these prophecies. God left a trail for us to be able to figure that out. This is what's amazingly mysterious but incredible about this Bible that maybe we've never picked up and read it, but this is what's inside of it. Now here's what's interesting. I'm not sure how a mathematician, I'm an engineer, so I appreciate math and stuff, but, but somewhere along the way, a mathematician sat down and said, of all the people that have existed, and all these prophecies, when it would happen, where it would happen, who would happen, for one person to fulfill all of these prophecies, the odds of that happening would be 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That's a better way of writing that number. What are the odds 
that there would be one human being who would fulfill at the right time, the right place, all of the prophecies in the Old Testament that pointed to the Messiah. One in whatever you call that number. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting thought. Well, where does the Bible come from? Well, the Bible claims it comes from God. The Bible claims that God used human beings to write down his thoughts, things that only he could know and only he could talk about in order to preserve something that would lead us to an understanding of who he is. But what is he really after? Right? In your, in your outline there, number two says, building a relationship. God is speaking. What, what's, what's God really after here? Is God just some historian who just wrote down a bunch of facts about some nation in the desert and things that went on and where they drove their chariots and how long they were here and then this guy died and another guy came, came along after him. Is he just a historian? Is that why we have the Bible? Or is the Bible about something else? Well, this is why we have the Bible. Apostle Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy. And he wrote these words. He says, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. That's the scriptures. From childhood, Timothy, you have been taught the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All right, so, what was Timothy reading as he grew up? This young man, Timothy, this is about 40 AD when he'd have been growing up. And Paul is writing this letter to him about 20 years later. So Paul writes and says, hey, you know, when you were little, you were reading this, these scriptures. Well, he wasn't reading the New Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. He was reading the Old Testament. Genesis, and Exodus, and Kings, and Judges, and Isaiah. Right? Those are the scriptures that he would have been familiar with. And yet the Apostle Paul says, those scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Wait, the Old Testament is about Jesus Christ? Wait, I thought the New Testament was about him. Or is the Old Testament about him as well? See, according to the scriptures... There's this one thing that the Bible is trying to communicate to us. It's trying to talk to us about the remedy to our need, the solution to our problem. And that's going to be Jesus Christ. And whether it's in the Old Testament, waiting for the day that he would come, or in the New Testament, looking back on the day that he did come, the whole Bible is trying to communicate that. Now listen, that's very different. That's, that's different than what I thought the Bible was about. Maybe it's different than, than what you've heard people describe the Bible as. It's really common for us to, to think that you know, the Bible is somehow, it's this, it's this written down set of rules you know, from a bunch of really, really, really old fashioned people out of date, out of touch, what do they know about style, written so long ago, How does it even apply? It's rules, right? It's a rule book, right? Isn't that what the Bible is? It's a moral rule book, and that if you'll try and do as much of it as you can, at the end of, the li end of your life, you kind of get a grade, and if you got like a 70, I guess you pass, and so you get into heaven, right? I mean, isn't that what the teachers say 70 is passing? I'm sure it's something like that. So we've never read the Bible, we haven't picked it up, but we're pretty sure that what it's about is just moral coaching. How to be a decent person. Okay. That's not what the Bible's about though. Or maybe we think the Bible is, you know, that interesting book that's, it's full of pithy little phrases and little nuggets of wisdom. You know, you kind of read it almost like a magic eight ball. Just, just you know, shake it and just put auto verse and read it, you know, and cleanliness is next to godliness. You know, it's like, hey, that's in the Bible, right? <laughs> God helps those who help themselves. Um, you know, that's a good inspiring word for people who are just kind of needing to get some self-motivation going on. Hey, dude, God helps those who help themselves. How many of y'all know that's not in the Bible? That's shocking sometimes. Like, what? Wait, that's got to be in the Bible. Now, the Bible never said that, but Ben Franklin said that. And I'm not quite sure how he ended up getting credit for it because I'm not even sure he believed accurately in God, much less in, in what God stood for. And what's interesting is that phrase, which so often is associated with the Bible is such the opposite of what the Bible has to say. 
The Bible's message from beginning to end is anything but God helps those who help themselves. The Bible's message actually is the opposite of that. God helps those who cannot help themselves. God did something in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ that had to be done for man. That man could never do. Man could never help himself. Man could never fix himself. And so from the very beginning, when the wheels come off of humanity, God is looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ will come and fix it. So the Bible's about Jesus all the way back in the book of Genesis. And in Exodus, we're learning things along the way. And God is putting this breadcrumb trail down to lead us so that when this person of Jesus Christ comes, you don't just say, Jesus Christ, you know, where did that come from? What, what's he all about? Well, he's about all this other stuff we've been learning for hundreds and hundreds of years so that we can figure out who he is when he finally comes, right? That's what was told to Timothy Timothy, from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, these Old Testament scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Even the Old Testament was preparing people to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're here, and again, my, my hope tonight is you're going to walk away from this meeting and go, hey, you know what? I'm, I've heard about the Bible. I've read bits and pieces in the Bible. Uh, but... I've never actually sat down and read the Bible. Well, I hope you're going to walk away with a curiosity that lets you go pick up a Bible and start to read it for yourself. And maybe your first objection to that is, but, but Keith, I just, I just, I just heard, and it's any, I can remember, I picked the Bible up one time, I just, I just thought it was confusing. I just, I just didn't get anything out of it. It just, just confused me. Um, all right, I, I, I get that. I get confusion. But, you know, confusion is what we have when we haven't done a little bit of work to get familiar with something, right? Everybody here has heard of the Roman Empire, right? All right, if I just start throwing names out at you, I, I, I'd be concerned that too many of you guys would pass a good hard test on the Roman Empire, right? So if I threw Caligula out at you and Nero out at you and Caesar uh, Augustus out at you, would, Tiberius, who came first? Who's last? Were they all together? How about the geography of the Roman Empire? Could you tell me where it was at what time and how it expanded and how long it took to go from one place to another? How many years the Roman Empire existed? What about the pantheon of the Romans? Do you know what the pantheon was? All right, there's all these ideas about the Roman Empire that were kind of like, well, but how many of you know that if you sat down and read about the Roman Empire, you could answer every one of those questions? Because it's really not that confusing. All right, for instance, let me, let me shift gears. Let's pull this out of the Roman Empire into another empire in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> and I start throwing out names at you like Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, the wise old sage Yoda. Right? You know where to put all those guys, don't you? You know something about the geography. You know who comes first and who comes second. You know who the villains are. You know who's against who. You know all this stuff, right? Can I, can I tell you that the Roman Empire is about as easy to understand as that empire. And the Bible is as easy to understand as Star Wars. I know that's shocking, but you just, you, just, you know... How many of y'all read the book Star Wars? See, you're waiting for a movie here. Now listen. <laughs> you're going to have to read the Bible, okay? I didn't know there's movies out there, but they usually are pretty bad. Um, all right, so what's, what's this book about? What's the Bible all about? All right, so let me see if I can just walk you through a quick running Star Wars type episode of the Bible and what it's about. All right, so here is, here's the Bible. Let me get out of the way here. Here's the Bible. The Bible is about one thing. It's about the gospel, right? That word gospel, you've heard it. It means good news, right? So the Bible is about this good news proclamation. So somewhere in the Bible, there's good news. 
and it's the one unfolding storyline. And it starts in episode one. We go all the way back to Genesis. Here's episode one, creation and fall. The origin of all things. Where did everything come from? Well, it started in Genesis. There's, there's a creator out there. We're going to get introduced to this character. He's the owner. He owns everything. Right? Now, some of us think we own some things. But I mean to know, when you're done here, you're going to really be done. How many of you guys get that? Everybody get that? You don't get to pack a piece of luggage and take it with you. When you die... I don't care how big your empire is, you're done. And somebody else now owns all that stuff. And then when that person dies, somebody else owns it, right? Because so we're, we're just temporarily occupying space here at best, but well, we're not the owner. And we introduce in the creation and fall episode to the source of suffering and man's problem. This is huge, huge news in episode one. If you miss episode one, can I just tell you? You don't get the rest of the episodes very well. Right, episode one introduces us to this thing that broke out in humanity. It's like a disease that got into the gene pool. This is like a good zombie movie, right? And every one of us, except it was just this really cheap three-letter word. This disease is called sin. And once it got inside of us, it was passed genetically to every human being. Every, every generation was going to have a sin disease that no matter what you did, try and cure it, try with all your might, you never will fix it. And man never has been able to fix this sin problem. But in episode one, there was this hint given by the creator that one day... I will do something. I will send someone to heal you of your disease. And that's all we get told about kind of in episode one. There's not a lot else available, but a promise that there's coming one who will heal us of this disease, this brokenness in us. And then episode two comes along. God chooses a people to work through. And we can introduce the guys like Abraham and Moses and David and this nation called Israel. It's like, why is this one nation of all these nations in the world, why does this one get so much attention? Well, because God chose to tell his story to these people in order to let them expose it to the whole world. That's just how he chose to operate. So when I pick the Bible up, I find a lot about this nation of Israel. Why? Why is all this stuff in the Bible about Israel? Well, because that's how God's going to tell his story through these people. And so we learn from these characters about God. And we're taught things like the Ten Commandments. We're introduced to something. If you've read the Old Testament, this can be really, really confusing. All of a sudden, you get introduced to this slaying of animals and there's bloodshed everywhere and there's sacrifices going on. What is all that mess about? Well, we get introduced to something called a sacrificial lamb. An innocent lamb whose blood would be shed and the guilt of man's sin would be transferred to that animal. And that's all we're told at that point. But it's kind of like, come back. There's another episode coming. So in episode three, the coming of the Messiah. The one who can save us and restore us to God. And one of the most powerful things that happens in episode three. And you can read it in... Uh, Matthew chapter 3, I believe. <clears throat> you have this man named John the Baptist. You guys, you all know who John the Baptist is? He says one of the most profound things that's ever said in Scripture. He looks up one day, he's baptizing people in the River Jordan. And up walking into the crowd comes Jesus Christ. A sea of faces! But God has shown this man something about Jesus Christ. And he stops everything he's doing. And he looks up at that man and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Where did he get that idea from? Well, he watched episode two. <laughs> he knew that somewhere in God's plan there would come a lamb who would shed his blood in order to forgive everyone's sin and finally heal this disease that's in every one of us. Right? And so that's where we meet the Messiah. And so episode 3 is about Jesus Christ and what he did. Episode 4 
after Jesus has died and been resurrected and he's returned to God having accomplished what he was sent for, he finished this work and he restored man to himself. And then episode 4 opens up with, okay, hey, just like in the Old Testament, there was this nation of Israel and their job was to go tell everybody about God. They didn't do a good job, by the way, but that was their job. You guys are Christians. Now your job is to go tell everybody about God and make sure that they know that there's a way for their sin disease to get cured if they'll just turn to Jesus Christ whom God finally has sent. He's already come now and he's been resurrected and gone back to the Father and there's forgiveness for anybody who will turn for him. Alright, that's episode 4. And then episode 5, the Bible talks about the future of all things. It lets every one of us know that when this earth and our life on this earth is over, there's another world that will continue for eternity, that every soul will live forever in a future place, either, either in heaven or in hell. And right, that's what the Bible is basically about. Right? It's, it's not just a collection of cool phrases. It's, it's just not some... Uh, idea book. It is one story that unfolds from the beginning all the way to the end. At every point, it's trying to get you to stare at one place. It's trying to get you to stare at that person of Jesus Christ who's going to come, or he has come, and he did something that's important for everybody who reads the Bible. Right? That's what the story of the Bible is all about. Right? Now listen, that's not any more complicated than being able to say, Darth Vader is really Luke's father. I mean, at some point, you're kind of like, oh, wow, really? Didn't see that coming. Well, the Bible's got some twists and turns in it. But if you'll pick it up, listen, I'm a high school guy picking up a Bible, and it, it made sense enough for me to keep reading and be affected by it. Now, let me close with this last thought. So a fellow wrote a book, <clears throat> R.C. Sproul wrote a book called Knowing Scripture. And, and this is just a profound insight of what he says. Because... If this book is written by God, then that alone makes it unique among any book that's ever existed. Right? He says this, One of the most important advantages the Bible gives us is that it provides information that is not available anywhere else. Only God can provide us with an eternal perspective and speak to us with absolute and final authority. The advantage of the equipping provided by Scripture is that knowledge is made available to us that can be learned from no other source. Right? Only a God who stands outside of time, who knows the beginning and the end. We don't know anybody like that. But God is that way. Only a God who knows exactly what our problem really is on the inside could design a cure to fix what really is our problem. See, there are some things that are in the Bible that you would think if the book is written by God, there are some insights about our lives that can only be found in the Bible. And you will find this is an amazing book. Um, let me do this. Let me, let me throw a few questions here at you that maybe you can discuss a little bit. But this is a great framework for four questions to ask any passage in Scripture. When you're reading through the Bible... Right? God had an agenda in writing the Bible. And it has to do with these four questions. What does this passage reveal about God? Right? What do we learn about God in whatever passage we're reading through? Secondly, what does this passage reveal about humanity? What, what kind of shape are we in? What are we like? What does the Bible have to say about what troubles us and what our problems are? And are we selfish or are we just always sacrificial? What does the Bible say about us? Three, what does this passage that we're reading reveal about the gospel? Remember, the gospel is that one storyline from the beginning all the way to the end. So everything in the Bible is related to that storyline. And last, how can I apply this passage to my life? Right, those three things that came before that question are much more important for you to ever answer that last question correctly. How does this apply to my life? Is, hey, what good is this for me? That's what I want to know. But I need to know those other three questions to figure out how is this really going to help me in my life. Right? All right. Um, I don't know how many Bibles we are supposed to have sitting on this table over here. But if you don't have a Bible, please make sure and don't leave tonight without one. Right, so there are some Bibles on a table over here. You're welcome to take one of those. Uh, if you do have a Bible, go home and dig it out of wherever it is. 
and pick it up and begin to read it. And if you have some questions about, well, where do I start reading? That's a great question for you to ask your table leader and maybe if you guys discuss around your tables. But I hope the one thing you'll do as a result of tonight is you'll get familiar enough with this to where you know more about what it has to say than you know about Star Wars. Because this is important forever. All right? All right, let's take a five-minute break. Go to the bathroom, come right back. <laughs>